All right, I think people will keep filtering in, but let's go ahead and get started. Thanks to everyone for being on time here today. Just wanna give you the heads up that like all of our lectures, I will record this and I'll post it after class. Um, first things first, thanks to everyone for being flexible and meeting online today. I know we're all sick of doing things online. I apologize for that. I actually found out yesterday I have shingles, which is super not fun, um, but I'm home hoping it's not contagious. It's the good news. I'm hoping to be back on campus uh, tomorrow or real soon. So we'll be able to pick things up uh, soon enough in person. But for today, let's uh, have our class online. You did not have a class program in advance of class today because we're expecting to be out catching uh, mud puppies today or seeing mud puppies today. Um, with that in mind, uh, we're going to continue our class material today and we're going to start in on reptile diversity. So our class today looks like this. Uh, just a quick update on our mud puppy trip that has been rescheduled. I have a herpetology in the news segment for you today. And then we are going to revisit the Chalman et al. 2017 mud puppy paper. This is the paper that you read for Monday and you discussed in a small group and completed, um, answered some questions about that. We're going to revisit that as a full group and make sure we've got a good understanding of what's going on with that paper. And then I will start in with a short lecture to get us started on reptile diversity. And we'll wrap things up. We've got a, a few uh, just reminders about upcoming assignments. So before we get into anything, um, what questions do you have about what's going on in class right now? And I think the best way, if we have questions today now or any time, just go ahead and unmute yourself and speak up. It's hard for me sometimes to keep track of like raised hands in the video. Also, I meant to mention this at the beginning. Uh, as with any of our video classes, if you're if you're if you are interested in keeping your screen on and giving me some visual feedback as I'm talking, that's super helpful. Um, but of course, I'm not uh, requiring that of anyone. All right. If there's no questions, let's go ahead and talk about our mud puppy trip. So that has been rescheduled um, for. It's been pushed back by two weeks. So we have the exact same plan with a Tuesday evening and a Wednesday during class trip and that's going to be on the 8th and 9th of February. So I'll provide more information as we get closer and we'll suss out transportation and things like that. But just make sure you get that on the calendar. And as a reminder, I'm asking that you go to one or the other of the trips. You're welcome to go on both. The evening trip will be scouting for mud puppies with flashlights and seeing if we can find them moving and also checking some traps. Um, and then during the day, they're primarily nocturnal. So during the day, we'll hopefully be able to see some mud puppies if they're in the traps. Uh, and on both days, the researcher, Ryan Wagner from OSC will be there to talk to us about his research and answer any of the great questions that you got for him uh, from class yesterday. So let's start off things today with herpetology in the news segment. This is a cool one. So this is a toad in um, South America that researchers uh, speculate, they don't have total evidence for this, but they speculate that its morphology, so its color and shape is mimicking this very, oh no, excuse me, this is not in South um, America, this is in Africa, and that it mimics this highly dangerous and venomous viper. And so the, the idea here is that the, the pat color pattern and the shape of this toad's body mimics the head of the viper and that a potential predator of the toad, for example, a primate or a bird, something like that, will look at the toad quickly and think it's a snake and then avoid it because it knows uh, based on the appearance of the snake that it's very dangerous. And in fact, there's been lots of studies, especially with primates, showing that they have very acute uh, sense of detection of snakes and avoid them um, with uh, great accuracy. And so what's cool about this is this is this is what's known as an example of Batesian mimicry, where a harmless species imitates a dangerous one. And I want to note here is that in the first uh, edition of Herpetology in the News, I mentioned that I wasn't going to include any questions on quizzes or exams on Herpetology in the News. I've rethought that a bit, and I do want to include some questions uh, about this because it gets to some important topics that we'll cover in class. So please be aware that um, you can, will have questions about these segments on your assessments, and we can review them uh, if you have questions about them. The takeaway message from this is that this is an example of Batesian mimicry, where a harmless species imitates a dangerous one, and so a potential uh, predator of this harmless species 
thinks, oh boy, that's dangerous, I'm gonna stay away, and it keeps the species safe. Now, what's important to note in this context is that the two species need to be sympatric, meaning that they need to have overlapping ranges that live in the same place. The opposite of the term sympatric is allopatric. So allopatric would be, you know, for example, um, garter snakes and cobras, kind of a dramatic example, but they live in very different places and there's no places uh, on the planet naturally, probably Florida, I'm sure there's everything uh, sympatric in Florida. There's no places where you'll find garter snakes and cobras together in the same place at the same time. And so we never expect, for example, a garter snake to um, evolve mimicry of a cobra. Sympatric means they live together. And so in this case, a potential predator of the um, mimicking species will um, essentially have learned the danger of the potentially dangerous species and then transfer that to the um, not dangerous species. And there's some cool examples of this in salamanders. So for example, um, the red F stage of the newt, Neotophthalmus viridescens that we talked about in class last week um, is a bright red coloration. And we talked about how they are toxic to predators. Uh, well, in some areas, the red back salamanders, the, the coloration more closely matches, uh, closely matches the red F. And, and the thought is that that's an example of Batesian mimicry where it's advantageous for the harmless redback salamander to look like the red F so that predators avoid it. There's a nice quote from the researcher here about this study. And he says, this is the first example in the world of a toad pretending to be a snake to avoid predation. So the results are both unique and important. And I've put a link to a popular science article about the study as well as the original publication in your class program for Monday. So cool stuff there. And there's actually lots of examples of Batesian mimicry in, associated with the reptile and amphibian world. There's another cool one I just saw where the back end of this caterpillar looks like the, a viper head. And it's it's actually, I should find photos of that for next class. It's remarkable how similar uh, the caterpillars, essentially the caterpillar's butt is to a viper's head and how uh, effective of a predator deterrence it is. All right, let's turn our attention now to the paper that you read for Monday. This the title is Estimating Mud Puppy Abundance in the Lamois River in Vermont, USA. And so I read over the survey and the feedback that you had from this paper. And so we're going to do a couple of things with this. Is first I want to just address some of the questions that you had about this study uh, together as a full group. And second, um, there's some aspects of the study I'd like us to kind of discuss in deep debrief and small. So to start, uh, one of the questions that came up a couple of times is what is a trap day? So for example, they said we had 5,942 trap days between December and January. Um, a trap day is a 24 hour period where there's a trap set. And so it depends on both the number of days you have traps, but also how many traps you have set. So for example, if you set 10 traps overnight, then you have 10 trap days, even though only one kind of calendar day has passed. So the, one of the questions you had was how in you know, this many weeks, how do they get 5,000 trap days when there's not that many days? Well, if you set a lot of traps, then you multiply the number of days by the number of traps to get a trap day. Just wanted to make sure everyone was clear on that concept. Um, another thing that came up is what is a pit tag? So a pit tag is a passive integrated, integrative, integrated transponder tag. And these are small tags that are about the size of a grain of rice. You can inject them in animals. Um, many of you that have pet cats or dogs, they probably have a pit tag injected into them. And what they do is when a radio signal is transmitted a certain frequency, they basically, they, they, the machine can detect um, the frequency of the tag and give you a unique identifying number. So here's an example of injecting one in a salamander. They're about the size of a, they say a grain of rice, but it's kind of like a big grain of rice and you can stick it subcutaneously or just into the body cavity, uh, depending on the organism. And ideally, it'll be a permanent, it'll stay with the animal permanently, although sometimes they can migrate out and the animal can reject it. Um, and then use the scanner. And when the scanner gets within, I don't know, something like 10 centimeters or so, uh, you get a reading with this long set of numbers and letters that's a unique to that individual tag. And so you know which animal. So they did, this is how they mark those individual mutt puppies. Another question that came up is how do they know if they recaught them? Well, if you put pit tags in them and then you, when you catch them again, you scan them to see if they're caught before or if they're newly captured. 
All right. Another question that came up a lot is the question of why didn't the researchers do more? Why didn't they look at this uh, traps mud puppies in other rivers? Why didn't they do this for more years, et cetera, et cetera? And I just want to talk for a second about this as a researcher. This is something uh, we're always keenly aware of. And the answer is because it's a lot of work and oftentimes impossible. So it would be fantastic if this study extended to seven other rivers in the area in over five more years. But just the pure number of amount of resources and person hours involved to do a big study like that is just, uh, it can be overwhelming. And so almost all of the time, um, when you see a study and you're like, why don't they just get more data? The answer is just logistical. Uh, it just isn't possible or, you know, either because of person hours or funding or equipment or something like that. And, and believe me, as a researcher, researchers are always wanting more data, but it's just not always possible. Now, I see a question in the chat from Michaela. Does uh, that hurt an animal as small as a mud puppy? Well, I don't know exactly if they described the methodology in, in this paper, but I know when I was working in France, they would inject pit tags in small salamanders. And to do it, they would actually anesthetize the animal. So they would, they would go under, the animal would be unconscious, they would do the surgery, and then the animal would wake up. And that has its own risks, of course. Um, I've done it with uh, larger turtles, and you can actually inject it in their conscious. It's just basically like getting a, a big shot. It's a big needle. So to answer the question directly, ideally, the answer is no, if done properly. Uh, it should be pretty safe and effective. And they're very widely used across a whole bunch of, of different animals, from mammals to mud puppies, uh, even just, I don't know if they use them in invertebrates or not. That's a good question. Thanks. All right. Uh, one last uh, point here I want to just clear up with the group is a number of you also asked, like, how do they know when they're taking measurements if they make mistakes? Uh, the short answer is you, you, they might be. And there's, you know, any data, uh, there's going to be some error in those data you know, because someone misidentified a male as a female or misreads the caliper numbers to measure the length or something like that. Um, a good research program and a good study will account for that. Uh, for example, by having two people independently determine the sex of an animal that they're looking at, making sure those jive. I know we've done work in the lab where we measure lizard body dimensions. Um, and, and this is something, actually Princeton, do you want to jump in here? And I'm going to put you in the hot seat here. I, I, I should have given you some advance notice. Do you want to jump in the hot seat and explain how we accounted for measurement error when we were measuring lizard morphology? I'm going to spotlight you for everybody. Sure, sure. OK. OK. So basically, on these lizards, we took a bunch of measurements of their body dimensions to see how like their morphology influenced their uh, performance and stuff that you'll learn about later. <clears throat> but basically to ensure that all of our measurements were valid, we actually took each, each measurement twice and we calculated what's called the coefficient of variation. Is that right? Yeah. And um, basically that's just a way of sort of seeing if these two measurements are, I guess, close enough that they would be good to use. And so basically we took each measurement twice and if the coefficient of variation was above a certain number, we would take the measurement again to try to lower that variation. And then in our data, and then in our data analysis, we would just average the two, um, the two numbers to get a good uh, uh, measurement. Right on. Thanks, Princeton. Thanks for uh, clarifying that. And that's a pretty um, commonly used uh, approach is to measure something more than once and then to assess how much variation there is between those measurements. Uh, we do that with lab work a lot as well. When we measure, for example, hormones in blood of lizards or snakes. We always measure it twice and we make sure those two values are really close. And if one of them, if they seem off, then we measure it again or we just don't. That's a great question. Um, all right, so before we move, we're going to move now to kind of a bigger group discussion. Uh, before we do, I just want to pause here and see if I can clarify anything from those questions or if you have any others. And you can just go ahead and unmute yourself and speak up if you've got a question. All right, so let's go, let's bring it back together then. And um, what I'd like to do is 
just brainstorm. One of the questions I asked you is what did they actually measure? And this is something that I will bring up over and over again this semester as we read papers. One of the kind of fundamental pieces of a paper that sometimes gets really lost uh, in, in the big story is like, what actually were the data? What were the data in hand that the researchers used to draw their conclusions or to test their hypotheses? And very often, it's, it's easy to overlook that, but I think it's fundamentally important so that we understand how this research is conducted. And so for this study, um, let's go ahead and just create a brainstorm list. Maybe I can uh, put it on the slide in real time or something like that. Um, what, what, what was it in this study here? I'll actually put this over here. What was actually measured? Oops. I'll just go ahead and keep like a running uh, note here. If I could spell, that would be helpful as well. All right, so let's go ahead and, and, and we're going to make a list and everyone's going to chime in. And you can chime in once and then we'll rotate to someone else to make it fair and fun. So give me, just shout it out. Total length. Total length. And that was Michaela? Yeah, that was me. Awesome. So that they're out there with calipers or a ruler or something like that. And they're getting that total length. And total length, remember, is the tip of the snout to the tip of the tail. Good. What else? This isn't really like a number, but the sex of the um, animal. Mm -hmm. And you're right. So for each animal, they're going to get a, a, a value data that's either M or F, right? But at the end of the day, when you do your analysis, you have numbers from this data. You say we caught 87 males and 42 females or whatever. So even for an individual animal, that's a, it's, it's called a categorical uh, measurement. Um, it might not be a number, but at the end of the day, when you have your whole data set, it's them. Good, Chase. Thank you. What else did they measure? Um, distribution, where they caught them, where they mm -hmm. caught the most from like lower downstream or near the um, dam. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thanks, Ellen. Yep, they marked the location of the capture. And that can be, location is, is tricky, right? Because it's in two dimensions and you can use a variety of ways to analyze that. For mud puppies, it makes it a little easier because they basically live along one dimension. They live along a river, right? And so the location is simply how many kilometers they are from a given point. Good, what else did they measure? Recapture rate. Recapture rate, Who, is that Ethan? Yep. All right, and tell me about what recapture rate, like what does the data look like for that? Uh, it's going to be another type of categorical where you mm -hmm. just put either, usually it's like you just have like, a, if you have like a sheet, you put like R for recapture or just nothing if not recaptured. Mm -hmm. Good. And so that is similar to male or female where you have it's categorical. So it's essentially a yes or no. Did we catch this animal before? Did we not? And again, for an individual animal, that's not a number, but when you get all of them together, you can then have what's called a recapture rate. What proportion of the animals do you go on to catch a second time? We'll talk more about this. This is a key idea in the salamander research we do with red back salamanders in the lab with our coverboard arrays. And the class will go visit those later this spring out at Krauss Preserve, and you'll see how we do the recapture rate. And you'll be able to see, uh, hopefully, if things work out, you'll be able to see Athena's masterful skills and actually marking those animals. Good. What else did they measure? The total number of animals caught. Yeah, the total number of animals. There you go. So that's, I mean, that's kind of fundamental, right? You got to know how many animals there are. Total number of animals. And that was Catherine. Was that you jumping in there? Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Catherine. What else did they measure? The water temperature. Water temperature. Is that Abby? Yes. Good. Water temp. Yep. So they're out there and that's, you know, sticking a probe, thermometer probe in the water and getting that, those data. What other environmental data did they collect? If any. Did they measure uh, precipitation? Um, I believe that they did. Here, let me pull up the study. I don't actually remember if they did precipitation. Um, and you can, can you see my screen when I share this? Do you see the PDF of the, okay. Always unsure with Zoom how that's going to work. Precip, let's see. Um, precip, oh, there's 26 incidents. Yeah, let's go here. Yep, they did measure precipitation. Good. And again, that is important. Um, to think about, especially with mud puppies now, they're not going to necessarily enjoy the rain directly or hide from the rain directly, but the level of precipitation is going to affect the water level in the river, 
which affects its flow rate, its turbidity, its temperature, and other factors that will play out in the month of Good. Thanks, Athena. What else did they measure? They also did water depth of where they trapped them. Ah, uh, perfect. Is this Sandy? Yeah. Yep. And that's, you know, you catch a catch an animal and then you're in there with like a yardstick or something and measuring how deep that water is. And the reason I'm kind of pointing this out is I want to make sure we have a visual of what is actually happening out in the field uh, each time they catch one of these animals. And you'll be able to see this firsthand in a couple of these things. What else did they measure? The size of the area. Size of the area. Who who is that? Was that Will? Yes. Yeah. All right. Can you talk about that in a little more detail? What the area of what? The area of where they were capturing the mud puppies in. Mm -hmm. Good. And I want to so, say it was like a kilometer of the river itself. Mm -hmm. And here's a good example. And, and actually, well, I'm glad you said this because I really want to, this is something I want to take away from this paper, is that the air, when we're talking about the size of the area, and we're gonna, I'm going to just call this the home range of the animal. So like over what range did the animal was the animal found. And you know, you can think of that in two dimensions for something that moves around, let's say a grassland or something. But for these guys, we're kind of think of it in one dimension because it's just along this river. Now what's important to note is you don't actually measure the area. You calculate the area or estimate the area based on your measurements. And your measurement for this is actually going to be um, your location of capture. So with the location of capture, as you capture animals repeatedly over time, uh, with this, researchers can then estimate the size of the area or home range size, right? And so you need those data over time, then you get a bunch of values along the river for where we caught this animal, and then you can take those two points that are farthest apart, and you can say, okay, what's the distance between them? It's 750 meters, and so that's the largest movement that we found. And so what I want to distinguish here is the data that's actually collected and then estimates that are made based on those data. So I'm really glad uh, you brought that one up though, because I wanted to touch on that as well. What else, anything else? I can't think of anything else off the top of my head. I have to go back and look. The number of dead. Ah, uh, unfortunately, yep, they did, they did uh, count the number of uh, dead animals and it was quite a high number after the application of the lampricide. Uh, unfortunately, which wasn't really supposed to be part of their study. They just happened to be there when they happened to be applying this stuff. So. Um, and this is very relevant to us because the lampricide is being used in the, the water where we'll find our mud puppies in a couple of weeks. So it's one of the things that Ryan and other researchers are interested in is how this um, pesticide affects the non-target species. Good. That's, that, I think that gets to my point here, and, and these are ideas that we'll revisit every time we read a paper, what was measured, um, and how they use those data then to make their, their conclusions. Did we miss anything, or anyone have any other questions about this before we transition to a little bit of a small group discussion? I mean, there was also I, snout bent length. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you said that. We, they did total length, I'll just add here, and they also did snout bent length, right. They measured both aspects of the body dimension. And as I um, remember from lecture, uh, snout vent length is kind of the most common method in lizards, snakes, uh, neurons, salamanders, uh, again, because that tail can be really bad or variable and doesn't really tell us about the body size of the animal so much. They weighed them too. Oh, they got their weights too, of course. Got their mass. And I think they use, did they use Pesola scales for that? Uh, I need to look here. They got their mass. No, that's Massachusetts. Did they get their mass? No. On page 424, it says they weighed them to the nearest gram. Perfect. Oh, I put weight. That's why it didn't come up. 424. I want to see, I just want to see what kind of scale that they used here. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Last paragraph. Um, or am I missing this? It's the first sentence of that paragraph. 
Oh, maybe, okay, that's all. So, okay, so if I was a reviewer of this paper, I would have a criticism of this method because they don't tell you how they do. Did they use a digital scale? Did they use a, uh, what's called a pisola scale, which is like a hanging scale where you put the animal in a sack and you hang it like that. How accurate was it? And it says, well, I guess it says the nearest gram. Um, I would have had questions about that as a reviewer because I think that leaves us wanting a little bit of information. They're lucky I didn't review this one. Good. All right, so let's bring it back. And what I wanna do now is I'm gonna split us up into smaller groups. And let me just go here so you can see the slide. And what we're going to do is talk about this idea. And all of you have brainstormed this. I'm interested to know what your ideas are for a follow-up experiment. Or I should, for this study, I guess, a follow-up set of observations. Now that we know this, like if we treated this study as preliminary observations, what would be the next step? What other information do you want to? So what I'm gonna do is break you into small groups. Uh, I'm just gonna set it up randomly through the breakout rooms. I'm gonna put uh, three-ish people in each of those groups. And I'm going to give you five minutes to talk about this idea, and then we'll bring it back to the full group. And it looks like I'm gonna do eight different groups. A couple of groups will have four people in them, and I will, um, I will bounce around and check in with each of them. So as I'm setting this up, uh, what questions do you have before I split everyone up into those groups? Okay, I'm gonna set you up there. You'll have five minutes to talk about it and then we'll bring it back to a full group. Here you go. here. Welcome back, everybody. I hope the discussion was fruitful. Uh, so you spent five minutes, you're talking about different potential uh, continuations of the um, experiment here. Let's hear from just a couple of groups. I'm curious to know what you came up with. Um, my group talked about just doing the same study either in um, different rivers or the same river for just an extended period of time, mm -hmm. um, something along the lines of like five years instead of mm -hmm. two. Right on, and why, why would that be advantageous? Why is that useful from a, a biology perspective? Um, if, we, if they were to do it in separate rivers, that's nice to compare um, the data that you collect. Mm -hmm. Or if you were to do just the same study for longer, you could get more um, maybe reliable data. Not saying that this mm -hmm. isn't reliable, but just like to confirm even more that the um, data that you collected is accurate and truly representative of their environment and how they live. Yeah, that's a great point. It can be really dangerous to draw conclusions about the relationship, say, between an organism, its environment based on one year's data. because weather and weather patterns and a number of other factors can change across years. And so if you're just taking that snapshot, uh, it can be a little bit misleading. Like if someone came and wanted to know what the climate was like in Ohio, and they just picked one day and they happened to sample January 26, 2022, they'd be like, oh, dang, it's cold there. I'm never going to Ohio. But if they did the same thing in July, they'd obviously get a very different idea. So increasing your sample size across time and across space is always a good idea. Good. Let's hear from one more. What other experiment would uh, add on to this, this study that you read? My group um, kind of said the same thing along the same lines, but um, a little bit different. Um, I suggested that you do like the same experiment in different rivers that have kind of like the same surroundings to see if you get similar results. Uh, um, mm -hmm. But again, over like a longer period of time. So like that river was like in a small isolated um like it was its own little thing, but if you do it in like a river, say it was in a river in Ohio, I can't remember where it was, but like in Ohio, and then you do the same kind of river in like 
Illinois to see or same type of river with like a similar like if it was in Delaware find another place that's kind of like Delaware with a river in it and see if you get same the same results yeah so in that sense you want to replicate the study across across these areas mm -hmm. and again that would allow you to see if those patterns hold up if they're different if mud puppies in Vermont where it's colder do something different than Ohio then they do something different in Louisiana or something like that. good what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put you back in those same groups, only this time only for three minutes to be a little bit shorter. And what I want you to think about is you've got these new experiment ideas is take some notes and brainstorm what data would you need to collect to conduct those experiments. So for some of you, it would be the same data that um, the experiment you read about collected just in different places. Um, but it would be important to note, you know, for example, how far away the study sites were something like that. For other experimental ideas, you're probably gonna to need to collect some new data. So you just came up with some big ideas about experiments, back to your group for three minutes and think about what data you would need to actually, uh, you would collect in those experiments. I'll bounce around again and say hi to as many groups as I can. There you go. I'll resume recording. I'll just give everyone a quick second to get back in front of their computer. I hope that's helpful. I don't, I'm, I'm not sure um, what everyone's preference for these kinds of Zoom classes is, but I assume my little break is always appreciated. All right, so for the next part of class today, we are going to talk about reptile diversity. And I wanna just acknowledge one thing. When I had planned out the structure of the class, I had planned on introducing amphibian diversity Kind of covering that for a couple of weeks and then transitioning to talk about reptile diversity because the trip has been moved and because of uh, moving class online it's getting a little mixed up and so what i'm going to do today is start our lecture on reptile diversity but then monday when we get back to class um, we're going to actually transition and talk about amphibians a little bit more the video that i want to show and some other activities and then we'll come back to reptile diversity so just be aware that we're going to kind of bounce a little bit back and forth between reptile diversity and amphibian reptile, and excuse me, amphibian diversity uh, over the next couple of classes. So reptiles, um, I'm gonna talk about them generally. They are ectothermic vertebrates. Let me make sure that I'm spotlighted for everyone here. Um, okay, I just wanna make sure that my video is with the recording. Okay, so reptiles are ectothermic vertebrates. So as you know, you know what vertebrates are, ectothermic, uh, like amphibians, means that they derive their body temperature from the external environment, they don't create their own heat. Although there are exceptions, uh, one of those being birds, of course, which are endothermic, many dinosaurs were endothermic, and some uh, reptiles actually are kind of endothermic with something called uh, gigantism. Essentially, they're so big, they have so much thermal inertia that they can retain a stable body temperature even as the environment changes. So a great example of that is a leatherback sea turtle, um, tuna fish, obviously not a reptile, but tuna is another example of uh, an organism that's commonly classified as ectothermic, but actually has many properties of an endothermic. Um, uh, reptiles are amniotetrapods. So let me unpack that a little bit. Amnio refers to um, organisms that have a, an amniotic egg. And so that is, um, reptiles, birds, and mammals are all considered amniotes. Tetrapods, of course, means that they have uh, four legs. So this is all the vertebrates that, um, uh, excepting what we commonly call fish. Now, the term reptile is paraphyletic. It's not a monophyletic group with respect to, I'm gonna, this is what we're gonna do for this question. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna ask the question, and then you're all gonna think of an answer for three seconds, and then I'm gonna, hone in on that energy and tell you what you said. So question, reptiles are paraphyletic to what group? That is amazing. 95% of you were thinking birds and you were correct about that. Good job. Uh, they're also found on every continent uh, except Antarctica naturally. So huge distribution up into the Arctic Circle, uh, for example, um, down through the tropics, of course. So reptiles are all over the globe. Reptiles have a uh, heart with, so thinking about their anatomy, their heart has a single ventricle with the exception of crocodilians. So they have three chambered hearts, two atria and a ventricle. We'll talk about that in a little more detail later in the semester. I mentioned they have an amniotic egg. 
Um, and the amniotic egg provides basically buffers uh, the egg from the external environment and allows reptiles to lay their eggs on dry land, as opposed to amphibians that um, have to lay their eggs either in water or in a very moist, very, very moist environment. They have direct development, meaning that the young are miniature replicas of the parents. They don't have a larval stage like many amphibians do. Their scale or their skin is covered in scales um, or scutes in the case of turtles, which is uh, keratinized tissue that uh, provides a buffer from the external environment. And they mainly, but notice this said mainly, not entirely, breathe through their lungs. So those are some just general characteristics of reptiles. Um, in an evolutionary sense, I'm going to go back here, and this is the phylogeny of terrestrial vertebrates. So I introduced this briefly in class when we talked about amphibians, and you can see our amphibians over here. Um, and notice that the sister group to all of the amphibians is this large group that includes mammals, as well as what we commonly call reptiles, including birds. And so we're going to focus our studies uh, on this area, but we're not really going to talk about birds. If you want to talk about birds, go see Dr. Reichard. That's not my job, although we are going to talk about dinosaurs. Uh, and birds are dinosaurs, so maybe indirectly we'll talk about a little bit about dinosaurs. Um, and I just want to make clear the evolutionary relationships among these groups. So remember this group called squ squamata, which includes snakes and lizards, is most closely related to this group, Rhynchocephalia. Rhynchocephalia contains exactly one species, the Tuatara. Those two groups then form the sister group to a group that includes turtles, birds, and crocodiles. So this is uh, a group that's called the um, Archelosaurs, is the name of this whole group, um, and with the group including birds and crocodilia called the uh, archosaurs, right? And you'll see that the dinosaurs are, are fit in over here as well. We'll talk about that in a couple of weeks. Um, so what's interesting to note, the takeaway message here is that turtles are actually more closely related to birds than they are to lizards and snakes. Um, and also that crocodilians are more closely related to birds than they are to any of these other reptilian groups. So that kind of turns our kind of common understanding on its head a little bit and also um, emphasizes the importance of, under, of evolutionary biology and how it works. But just superficial appearance doesn't necessarily mean that two things are closely related, or if those two things are um, don't look anything like each other, that doesn't mean they're distant related. So crocodiles, birds, that little house sparrow, and a giant alligator are more closely related in their evolutionary history than that sparrow is to um, a little mouse or something like that, and that crocodile is to a lizard or something like that. So that's cool. All right, so just continue the overview. We have, as I mentioned, the group Rhynchocephalia includes one species. Uh, they used to be quite widespread around the globe, but there's just one species left that lives on some islands off the coast of New Zealand. It doesn't even live on the two main islands of New Zealand anymore. That's because of people and rats. There's Crocodilia. Uh, there's 24 species of crocodilians. So this includes alligators, gharials, caimans, and crocodiles. There is 350-ish species of turtles around the world. And by far, the most speciose group of reptiles is your squamata, which includes lizard snakes, another group that's often called slow worms. But they're neither slow nor worms. They're kind of slow. They're not super They should be called like not fast squamates, to be more accurate. Uh, but those are, the, those are the group known as amphisbanians. Uh, there's over 10,000 species in this group. Now, I'm not going to ask you questions about the specific number of species of these different groups. The takeaway message here is that there's just one species of tuatara. You might ask me that one. Um, and that there's a couple dozen species of crocodilians, a couple hundred species of turtles, and 10,000 species of squamates. So I just want you, the takeaway message here is that most reptile species are squamates, the overwhelming majority. Um, and there's not that many species of turtles or crocodilians. I'm going to pause here and I'm going to talk about the Tuatara rhynchocephalia in a little more detail. Um, let me make sure I did set the recording to. Okay, good. Uh, what questions do you have so far? Okay, so let's talk about Tuatara. So there are exactly one species of tuatara in the world, and there's exactly zero of those species here in Ohio. 
Uh, Tuatara comes from an indigenous, uh, uh, the indigenous group from New Zealand word for meaning spines on the back. You can see what they look like here. At first glance, it kind of looks like a lizard, uh, very lizard-like in its general appearance. But if you take a close look, it has some qualities that don't really match with uh, what we think about as a lizard. Um, interestingly, they differ in, in some really important ways from uh, most other lizards in their lifestyle. So they're active at night, they're a burrowing species, they live underground, they eat insects. Uh, they have a primitive skull, a kind of skull called a diapsid skull. Um, that word we'll talk about in more detail later this semester, but the takeaway message is that it's the same kind of skull shape, specifically the number of fenestrations or holes in the skull as, um, as the ancestors of squamate reptiles and Excuse me for one second. Sorry, my 13-year-old son is running around the house and yelling things. I don't know if it's coming through the microphone or not. OK, so let's see what else. And so what's interesting about these guys, too, is um, they have very slow life histories, meaning that they take a very long time to reach sexual maturity, so between 10 and 20 years, around the same amount of time as humans. They can live for more than 100 years, and they reproduce uh, very not very often. And they generally live in kind of cold environments. And they they move uh, well. They they can move a little bit fast, but they they their their lifestyle is a slow one. Um, they can get uh, to about 30 centimeters in body length. So actually, I have a, a conveniently I have a ruler here. I don't know if you can tell scale on this thing. But they can get snout bent about that big, so about the size of a, of a good size uh, lizard. And they also have this cool organ on the top of their head called a parietal eye that's important for uh, light detection and, and can be uh, useful for predator avoidance. So just a kind of general overview of their lifestyle and their morphology. We won't, this class is going to focus a lot on Ohio herps, so I'm not going to talk about these guys too much. But what is super important to recognize is that they are the last species in this lineage of reptiles that used to be very speciose and found across the globe. But now there's only this one species left in this entire uh, in this entire. All right, let me return here to our overview. Uh, I did this slide, and we're going to transition now and talk about squamata to get us started. The reason we're going to talk about Squamata first is because Dr. Mason from OSU is going to be with us in a couple of weeks talking about venom and venom evolution in Squamata. So I want to make sure we have a good um, understanding of the evolutionary background of these guys before he comes in. And so let's talk about that in a little detail. Remember, the Squamata are a monophyletic group, meaning it, it includes all of the descendants of the most recent common ancestor. Uh, so there's no there's no organisms that are that are in there that we don't consider squamates. And what's important to note is that snakes are a monophyletic group within squamates, um, but lizards are a paraphyletic. Let me unpack that a little bit and start us off by talking about snakes and snake diversity. So snakes are a super speciose diverse group uh, within squamates. They are monophyletic, meaning that all snakes are more closely related to each other than they are to any other groups. And they can take a huge diversity of, of um, body forms and sizes and habitats and lifestyles. We have snakes that are exclusively um, oceanic, meaning that they never come on dry land. We have snakes that live uh, entirely in trees. There's flying snakes that can actually, um, I guess it's not technically flight, they're gliding snakes, but they can very precisely control their movements and use their body like airfoil. Uh, we have tiny little snakes that live underground and ants, et cetera, et cetera. There's a huge diversity of snakes. So let's look at the squamate phylogeny. Here is a figure from a paper that came out a couple of years ago. And I'm a little hesitant. OK, so here's a, here's a caveat with this. Squamate phylogeny is a super contentious area. Uh, it's really newly, uh, what am I trying to say? Here's what I want to say. So remember that anytime we have a phylogeny, that's a hypothesis about the evolutionary relationships among different of organisms. And it's a hypothesis because we can't observe it. We can't observe, uh, we don't have organisms from, you know, 200 million years ago to see who they lived and who they mated with, what babies they had. And, and we were not able to observe this over these kinds of 
time scales. So we have to hypothesize about these relationships. And those hypotheses can change over time. The squamate phylogeny is a great example of that because our understanding of how of these different groups uh, have been related to each other over time uh, is, has been changed a lot and is the point of some contention. I'm going to show you one uh, kind of example of this with the caveat that not everyone is going to agree with this. And I'm not necessarily espousing this and saying, hey, this is the best thing. My area of expertise is not in unpacking these evolutionary relationships and phylogenetics. Uh, but I want to show you one example of what we think is the evolutionary relationships among these groups and probably a pretty good hypothesis about those relationships. So here's a figure from a paper that came out uh, a few years ago that describes the relationships amongst all of the different squamate groups. And I want to walk you through some of the important takeaways. The first is you see a branch uh, over here um, that is um, the, 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 okay, let me start here. The most recent common ancestor of all of the squamates you can see here in this red dot. And notice the first branch off of that is, are the geckos. Um, and you all have probably seen something like a leopard gecko. Know that there's also other geckos that are legless and essentially looks like worms. So leglessness is actually a characteristic that has evolved many, many times in squamates, uh, in snakes, most notably, but in a number of other groups as well. So essentially geckos here is the sister to all other squamates. We have skinks over here as well. They branch off pretty early um, from the most recent common ancestor of all of the other uh, squamates, except in geckos as well. Then we have this other group of lizards um, include, that includes the lacerted lizards. So these are um, uh, lots of small diurnal active lizards found across the globe. A good example of that is the Podarsis lizards that we study, lizards in the genus Podarsis. Um, this group also interestingly includes the so-called slow worms, the uh, Amphisbanians, our sister to all of these lizards. Now, if you'll notice here too, um, actually, let me go here. Next, we have our snakes. So notice that if we follow this branching pattern, that snakes are nested within all of these other lizards. The snake group is more closely related to the lizards down at the bottom here that I'll talk about in a second. And in, in these lizards, iguanas, et cetera, are more closely related to snakes than they are to geckos and skinks and certain. Notice one other cool thing. I don't have this highlighted on the slide, but notice that the sister group uh, over here to serpents, to snakes, is actually mosasaurs. These are uh, often very large, entirely aquatic, um, now extinct group of reptiles. They're commonly associated with dinosaurs because they lived at the time of dinosaurs. Um, they're no longer with us, unfortunately, but fortunately, I guess, if you like to surf. Um, but it's interesting to think that that's actually the sister group to uh, our living snakes. That's cool. The other neat thing is that um, Sister to all of the snakes is this group of lizards that's super diverse and includes iguanas, gnolls, fence lizards, gila monster, a whole bunch of uh, different kinds of lizards uh, are in this group, and they are sister to the snakes. And so, again, to say this another way, that all of these lizards you see here, iguanas, gnolls, etc., are more closely related to snakes than they are to these other kinds of lizards like skinks and geckos and amphibians. And so, in that sense, when we talk about lizards, the term lizards, we should actually use air quotes because it is a paraphyletic group with respect to snakes. Snakes are essentially just a highly, I shouldn't say just, they are a highly derived uh, group of lizards. By highly derived, I mean that they are, they exhibit traits that are very different from their most recent common ancestor of lizards. And for snakes, that includes an elongated body, lack of limbs, um, one, uh, essentially one lung, and some other characteristics that separate them from lizards. One last point here is the node, the most recent common ancestor uh, between snakes and the group of lizards that includes iguanas is here. And this group then is, um, the, this group that includes snakes and the lizards like iguanas is sometimes known as toxicophora. And this is uh, a term that's given in in specific reference to the possession of venom or venom glands uh, in these organisms. So the idea here is that this most recent common ancestor possessed uh, the, the capacity for venom and that all of these, uh, therefore, all of these groups either have that or have lost that over evolutionary time. And I'm gonna leave it there. 
I'll let Dr. Mason talk about that in more detail. So our take-home points from this phylogeny are that quote-unquote lizards are paraphyletic with respect to both snakes and amphisbanians. Snakes are a highly derived group of lizards, and snakes, in fact, are monophyletic. I'm going to pause here. It's a lot of information on squamate phylogenies. and Make sure you can get notes caught up and see what questions you have before we move on. Any questions? All right, let's talk a little bit more about snakes then and, and squamata, uh, I guess squamata generally and snakes specifically. So there are 33 species of squamates in the state of Ohio. Uh, that includes five lizards and 28 snakes. So as I mentioned, squamates are by far the largest group of reptiles, over 10,000 species, including lizards and snakes. Um, some of this information I just presented, snakes are specialized lizards, quote unquote lizards are paraphyletic with respect to snakes. All of these, uh, these organisms in all these squamates have a pair of copulatory organs, so I'll describe this in more detail, but basically uh, the males have a double penis um, and they use one of those at a time during mating and this allows them to mate with females kind of from either side, so they generally have these elongate bodies and when they mate, they put the base of their tail together, kind of next to each other. And having this hemipenes, this double penis, allows the male um, to mate on either side of the female. So that's cool. Um, also, I mentioned that there has been a loss of limbs in multiple lineages, um, including snakes, but also geckos. A number of skink groups are legless. There's legless lizards um, in another family. And so what we think of as this snake body form is actually not unique to snakes. And finally, they all have some kind of tail. And the tail is important because it uh, serves a, a variety of different functions in different groups. Some species store energy in their tail. So for example, like geckos with fat tails, they sell sort of fat uh, in their tail for later use. Um, some of them use their tail to help them locomote either in water or in arboreal habitats. Some of them have highly specialized tails that can be uh, used as a, a deterrent for would-be predators, rattlesnakes, for example. So the tail is an important aspect of these squamates morphology as well. And we'll talk about some of those examples in more detail. So what I want to focus on today is snakes. And so there's a ton of snake families. I don't have the actual count off the top of my head. Uh, don't worry. You don't need to know all of these or memorize them except for four of them. These four are the Boidae, the Viperidae, the Elapidae, and the Colubridae. Notice that all of the snakes in Ohio are found in just two families, Viperidae and Colubridae. Uh, and then I'm also just going to talk a little bit about two other um, kind of more prominent families uh, of snakes, and that is Elapidae and Boidae. So let me walk through these four families in a little bit of detail. And then we'll get into even more detail about snakes here in Ohio. So first I want to talk about the Elapidae. These are cobras and their closely re related relatives. So a great example of this is Ophiophagus hanna, the king cobra. Um, these guys live in a variety of habitats. They're, they can be arboreal, tree dwelling, or they can be fossorial, which means they live underground. There's 61 genera, so uh, there's a lot of species in this family. Um, they have a large shield scale on their head and round pupils. Uh, I don't have a good image here, but the shield scale is basically the top of their head has one large but a single scale in the middle. Uh, they have fangs. They are venomous, and so they have what's called proteroglyphous fangs. Um, keep that term in the back of your mind. I'm not going to ask you to know it now, but I will later when we talk about fangs and fang morphology when we get into venom. But protero proteroglyphous fangs simply means that they're, they're fangs that are in the front of the mouth and they're fixed, meaning that they point down. Uh, and this is opposed to another kind of fang that are hinged and they can kind of rotate out when the snake bites. These guys have fangs that are always in the same position. They have unkeeled scales, which means their scales are smooth. I have a diagram to show you that in more detail coming up. And they have very long and slender bodies uh, generally, and they can kind of look like blue snakes. 
And finally, most of them are oviparous, meaning that they are egg laying. So one thing you'll note is that snakes, a good number of them give live birth and a good number of them lay eggs. So that's just a general overview of elapidae. Coral snakes are also in this family. They're closely related to, to cobas. The other family I wanna talk about that's not in Ohio is boidae. These are commonly known as boas. You've probably all heard of them. They are famous for their ability to overpower their prey via constriction. It's important to note that when they do this, it's a common misconception that they crush their prey to death. It's actually not true. They asphyxiate their prey. So what they do is they wrap around their prey tightly and they wait for that prey to exhale so that it can take a breath. And when it does, they clinch a little more so that the, the animal, let's say a rodent, exhales and then can't inhale. And they basically hang on until the organism uh, asphyxiates and then they eat it. In this family, the females are larger than males, and this has to do with the fact that they're viviparous, most of them, meaning that they give live birth. So the larger female size allows the female to carry more babies. And a famous example of that is the green anaconda. The females of the species especially get huge, um, and then they give live birth in water, and they're, they're, the babies, when they're born, they're like pretty sizable, because it's a pretty sizable animal. Uh, it would be a dream of mine to watch an anaconda give birth in the wild someday, or even just see them in the wild. They're cool. Um, I want to talk about their jaws with the upcoming slide. They have something called uh, palatal teeth. And I'll just leave that term for now. I have the, the next um, slide actually shows you what that means. Um, many of them have a functional left lung. And this is notable because in snakes, generally the left lung is just this little vestigial shriveled raisin of a lung that they don't really use. And instead they just have one elongate lung. So you think about your uh, thoracic cavity, your chest, right? Us humans have paired lungs that kind of fit neatly in what's more or less this kind of square body shape. Snakes have this long skinny body shape. So it doesn't make sense for them to have two lungs next to each other. So over evolutionary time, in most cases, the left lung has become vestigial and the right lung just becomes this long, like one, you know, like one of those balloons that they make like the dogs and stuff out of? It's basically that shape. Boas have a, a stouter body, generally speaking. And so some of them have a functional left lung. They actually do have a pair of left lungs. They also have a vestigial uh, pelvic girdle, which means they have some little hip bones um, back uh, near the base of their tail, which is neat. They don't, they're, as far as we know, they're not really functional, but they're just kind of left over evolutionarily. Now, when I return to this term, uh, palatal teeth, so boas have these two rows of teeth. And here's a nice diagram to show you what this means. So this is uh, the jaw of a snake, and this is an inferior view. So I mean, imagine you're inside the mouth looking up at the snake's jaw, and they have what's called marginal teeth on the outside here, and then they have these palatal teeth here. They have this double row of teeth. And this is a boa constrictor, which is an example of a species in the family Boidae. And this is notable because, as I mentioned, they're known for, for um, killing their prey by asphyxiation, not by biting. But in that process, it's super important that they can grab the organism tightly so that they can wrap around it. And then also very often they eat large prey items. And so this double row of teeth is really important as they swallow prey items that in some cases are bigger than they are. They don't have hands or legs to shove that food in their mouth, so they essentially need to walk over the prey with their teeth. And to help them accomplish this, they have this kind of double row of teeth. They have these marginal teeth and then these palatal teeth. Let me pause there and think about how much more I want to cover today and look at the time and see what questions. I have a quick question about the pelvic girdle. Any questions? I have a quick question. Oh, SK. Mm -hmm. I see yeah. you're talking, but I don't hear you. Uh, that's weird. I don't mm -hmm. have some. Can other people hear SK? I can. Oh, I can't hear anybody. Ethan, did you unmute yourself there? That's weird. I don't know what's going on. I see people are saying, yes, you can hear that. Oh, great. Stupid Zoom. Okay. Um, let me try one thing. Let me unmute Meet myself. All right. Try again. Can you hear me? Dang it. No, I can't hear you. 
Yeah, go ahead and type it in the chat. Can you, can. I apologize. I'm not can sure you hear why. This? this happened actually when it went to a couple of the breakout rooms. All right, while you're typing that in the chat, I'm just going to take a quick second to see if I can fix this. Please type in your question and I'm just checking the sound. So I apologize to everyone. Okay. Um, all right. So question here, what is the benefit of pelvic girdle in live births? It doesn't seem too important uh, in boas as a vestigial structure. Good question. Um, so it's, are you, so you're asking specifically for, for boas and pythons, I guess, well, not pythons, but boas if it has a, an importance in terms of their giving live birth. You can try unmuting yourself again. I just adjusted my sound, maybe it'll work now. Uh, maybe more in general. Nope, not working. Dang it. Sorry, I know, I realize that's frustrating. And I have no idea why it's. Okay, so the pelvic girdle in, in us bipedal mammals is super important because that is what gives us the ability to move, walk, and run bipedally. And there's a trade-off there in the size and shape of that pelvic girdle relative to the size and shape of a baby emerging from it. Now in snakes, that's kind of out the window because they don't need it to walk or move. And also um, they're just their internal anatomy is different. And in, in, in these guys, essentially they have this, these two little bones that are on the, the kind of margins of their body rather than a fully enclosed, like uh, complete um, circle of a pelvic bone or something like that. So I guess for the snakes, it doesn't really matter much. Uh, in other organisms, it, it represents a really important trade-off between locomoting and giving birth to bigger babies. And that's especially true uh, in humans. Does that answer your question, SK? Okay, cool. Thank you for asking that one. Uh, yeah, you should take vertebrate anatomy. We talk all about that stuff. It's good times. Okay, um, a little bit frustrated that my sound isn't working. So I will just keep a closer eye on the chat. If you have questions, just go ahead and, and put them in the chat. All right, I wanna, do wanna talk a little more about a couple other families, and, uh, but not too much more. So the other family I mentioned, uh, and this is a family that is found here in Ohio, is Colubridae. Uh, in fact, Colubridae is a huge family in the evolutionary relationships amongst these species is pretty poorly understood in some cases. And so, in fact, um, recent work suggests that Elapidae might be nested within Colubridae, which would make Colubridae paraphyletic with respect to Elapidae. So essentially, that means that cobras are highly derived uh, Colubrid snakes. This family is huge. It includes like almost two thirds of living snake species, including a number of venomous snake uh, species. An example here in Ohio is the common garter snake, Thanophis sertalis. These are not venomous garter snakes are a group of snakes that are widespread and very common and conspicuous across North America. And there's a number of species in this family in Ohio. We'll talk more about those in, in upcoming classes. Do you wanna just talk about the common garter snake for one second and, and emphasize the variation that we see within species. So here are three garter snakes. Um, I got a question in the chat, does extant mean living? Yes, uh, extant is the opposite of extinct. Thanks for asking that. Um, we see a lot of variation amongst species, but we also see variation within species. So just a quick example of that is this uh, garter snake species, the common garter snake. These are three animals actually found at the same time under the same rock of the same species. And you can see how different their color patterns are um, in appearance. And so with squamates generally, it's important to recognize that just because two things have the same color or look the same, may or may not mean that they're closely related. We need to look to other characters for that as well. I'm gonna wrap things up here. I wanna talk a little bit about, do I wanna get into this? Um, let me just assess real quickly here what slides. Yeah, let's wrap this up. So this is probably about five more minutes of lecture here and we'll wrap things up. We've done a lot today. 
Uh, a couple important characteristics as we get into details of identifying the different species of snake is the anatomy uh, of the head and scales of a snake. We have uh, some field guides and some other books that have this information. So you don't need to copy this down in your notes or anything. And it's not something I necessarily want you to have memorized, but rather know how to use it in a reference book, with the exception of a couple important terms here. And that is the rostral scale, which is this uh, essentially the scale on the tip of the nose. When I move my cursor around the slide, you can see this, yes. Okay, the rostral scale at the tip of the nose here, uh, the labial scales, which are these scales on the upper and lower lip. And those are important for identifying different species of garter snakes. And then also we'll learn to identify scale row numbers. And so this is the uh, lateral view of a snake from the side and basically moving from the belly up to the top of the back, those rows are numbered. And that's important for identifying garter snake species as well. And we'll be looking at all of these in live animals, uh, well, museum specimen animals, but also, as I mentioned later in class, we'll be getting outside and catching some of these guys down in our, our little Delaware run. Another important feature that's often used to describe uh, snake species is whether their anal plate is divided or undivided. So here we are looking at the belly of a snake. So this is the venter or underside of an animal. Its head is going to be up here and its tail is going to be down here. And in snakes, we don't, it's, it's not necessarily obvious where the body ends and the tail begins. But if you know your anatomy, you can tell that where the, the cloaca is, um, you can see that and basically everything posterior to the cloaca is the tail and everything anterior is the body. Now they call the scale that covers the cloaca the anal plate, which is weird because they don't call it an anus, they call it a cloaca. Why it's not called the cloacal plate, I don't know. But whether or not that plate is single or divided uh, is an important characteristic in identifying some snakes and you'll see why. And by single, I mean it's a single scale going all the way across. Divided simply means that it's two scales kind of next to each other. You can see in snakes, all of the ventral scales, the scales anterior to the vent are single, but posterior to the vent, they can be either divided, and these are called subcaudal scales, caudal referring to the tail, or they're undivided. And again, we'll look at this in more detail. I just want to introduce these ideas. We'll be using some keys to work through and identify different species. The final characteristic I want to talk about is keeled versus smooth scales. So I mentioned that Elapidae, the family that includes cobras, has uh, unkeeled scales. And this has to do with the shape of the scale as it rests on the body and whether or not it has a keel, just like a boat or something like that. So smooth scales, uh, you can see an example here, don't have this keel down the middle, whereas keeled scales have this kind of line that protrudes right down the center of each of those scales. And each scale has this. And this is an important feature. And this is nice because if you find a, a shed snake skin out and about, you can help yourself identify what species it is by looking and seeing if those uh, scales are keeled or unkeeled. So with that in mind, I wanna show you one more family here of snakes, and that is Viperidae. Uh, an example is the timber rattlesnake, Crotalus horridus. Ooh, I have a misspelling in this slide that is unacceptable. Where are we here? How does that happen? Oops. Okay, there we go. Uh, Crotalus hurtus, the timber rattlesnake. And so these are snakes that are commonly called vipers. And this includes rattlesnakes. Um, they can be terrestrial or arboreal. Most uh, are live birthing, so they're viv viv ah. Can't talk. Uh, they are uh, viviparous. And so rattlesnakes are a good example of that. And so if you ever go to a novelty store and see them selling rattlesnakes egg, you can be like, look, can't happen. Uh, they are venomous and they have fangs that are called salinoglyphs. And this just means that they're hinged. Again, I'm introducing this term now. We'll look at it in more detail later in the semester. But they have these oftentimes very long fangs that rest kind of against the roof of the mouth when the snake is not biting. And then when it bites, they, they, they move outward. And this allows them to be much longer than they could be in like a cobra that has the, um, the protero proteroglyphous fangs that are fixed. They're also kind of famous for their heat sensing organ in their face, commonly called the heat pit. 
uh, super good at detecting very, very minuscule differences in temperature, which is really important when you're nocturnal and you're hunting something that is warm blooded like a rodent. Most of these guys have these keeled scales that I mentioned in the last slide. Um, often they have a triangular shaped head that's wider at the, at the neck. Um, and so they're, they're kind of famous for having these uh, triangular shaped heads. And a lot of other species actually imitate that as well. And they have a vertically elliptical pupil. So if you look at their eye closely, slide, um, you can see that the pupil is, is this kind of vertical ellipse rather than in um, uh, Elapidae, they have this circular pupil. And there's a couple of species in this family in Ohio. Let me see if I want to get into this. You know what, there's, I have some more details here about these guys in Ohio, but I think that's actually a nice way to lead off for our next class. So I'll just leave this uh, here and see what questions you have before we wrap things up. OK, just a few reminders then. I'll come back to these guys uh, in our next class. I want to remind you we have a quiz in our next class on Monday. A number of you might uh, want to take the quiz in the testing center. Um, if you are going to do that, but please arrange with the testing center and let me know as soon as you can so we can arrange accordingly. Um, a few of you I've talked to individually about that. Uh, in general, anytime you want to take it on Monday is fine with me. Um, the, class, the quiz will be given in class. It is closed book on Monday. You can expect short answer, multiple choice, and drawing questions. And I'll be specific uh, drawing phylogenies questions. Now remember that um, this will only cover material from the first four lectures. So what we covered today will not be included on your quiz. Um, that gives you a chance to digest uh, the material and make sure you have a chance to ask questions. You'll have 20 minutes in class. So those of you that have extended time, you'll have 30 minutes for it. Um, and be sure, I recommend using those um, learning outcomes at the end of each of, oh, I have set lecture slides, at each of the class programs as essentially your study guide for the quiz. All of the questions will be based on those learning outcomes. Questions about your quiz on Monday? OK, I would like to, oh, Princeton, you can jump in. Okay. Oh, yeah, actually, I know. You should go. Cool, cool. <clears throat> All right, um, so I have a question for the class. Um, would it be helpful if I sort of organized like a little study session for our first quiz? All right, cool, cool. Yeah, so I can definitely put one together. Um, yeah, I don't know. I can just text in the group me or something um, and we can have a little, a little uh, study session together. So, yeah. All right, uh, Princeton, I see that you're muted. This is interesting. I have no idea what you said, and I see a bunch of, of yeses in the chat box. I'm just kind of guessing. I was like, should I teach the class now instead of Dr. Gangla for the rest of the semester? Yes. Uh, no, I, I think Princeton introduced he's going to organize the study session. So um, we'll disseminate that information. Is that accurate, Princeton? OK, cool. Sorry, I don't, the audio is weird. All right. One uh, other piece. Oh, Ethan had a quick question as well. Ethan, you're going to have to type it in because I don't have audio. Here. I don't know what's going on. Uh, colubrid venom with Dr. Mason. Yes, you will absolutely be talking about the evolution, the ecology and the evolutionary context of venom. So for sure. All right, um, in addition to preparing for your quiz on Monday, I also have an assignment for you on your class program. And this is cool. This, uh, you have a podcast to listen to. It's about an hour long interview with an amphibian biologist named Priya Nanjapa. Uh, it happens to be from a podcast that I have an affinity for called Ologies. Uh, the host, Ali Ward, interviews all kinds of researchers and scientists about topics. Um, it gets a little bit off the rails at times, but it's kind of fun and is a cool mix of, in my opinion, of being entertaining um and also just giving you a ton of great scientific information and also in my opinion kind of uh um what's the word i'm looking for um 
humanizing scientists and researchers. Uh, and, and with that in mind, note that it, Ellie and Priya have a bit of a rapport, and there's a lot of swearing this episode, so if you're listening to it around uh, someone with sensitive ears, just be aware of that. In conjunction with this um, podcast, there are a number of, oops, it's getting ahead of, myself, ahead of myself, there's a number of questions I'm asking you to respond to in Blackboard, um, including some longer uh, paragraph long questions in relation to toad reproduction specifically. So go ahead as you're um, listening. Those, those questions are detailed in your program and they're in Blackboard. Be sure to read through the questions before you listen so that you can um, think about that as you're listening. Otherwise, um, just a reminder that I do have open hours on Mondays from noon to two. I hope that I'm back on campus by then. And I just want to say thank you to everyone for being flexible and being online again today. That's all I've got. I will stop the recording here, but I will stick around online if you have any questions. Happy to chat. And otherwise, have a great rest of the week, everyone. And I will talk to you soon.